Welcome to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. The show covering all things health, wellness, culture, and more. The show for all of us who aren't old, we're better. Each week, we'll interview superstars, experts, and ordinary people doing extraordinary things, all related to this wonderful experience of getting better, not just older. Now, here's your host, the award-winning Paul Vogelzang. Welcome to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. I'm Paul Vogelzang, and today we delve into a riveting chapter of espionage history with our Smithsonian Associates interview series. Our special guest is Liza Monday, an acclaimed journalist and author who brings us her groundbreaking work, The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA. Lisa Monday will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates coming up, so please check out our show notes today for details on Liza Monday's presentation at Smithsonian Associates titled The Secret History of Women at the CIA. We'll be talking with Liza Monday today about her upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation, her new book, The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA, about a hidden narrative at CIA, the post World War II role of women. These women often relegated to roles like sending cables, making clandestine dead drops, and meticulously maintaining the agent's secret files faced a ceiling of discrimination. Yet, it was perhaps the very underestimation that carved their path to becoming some of CIA's most astute operatives, including clandestine trips to a morgue in the Mediterranean. Malta, November 1985. The body on the gurney could so easily have been her own. Heidi August stood in a hospital morgue on a chilly Mediterranean morning. November was a cold month on the island of Malta contemplating the white sheeted body of a woman. The sheet was folded back to reveal the woman's face, which was framed by a rich tangle of long red hair. She wore a necklace with a crucifix, the same cross she had on in the photo of her American passport, which Heidi held in her hand. Heidi stood, shifting her gaze from the photo to the body and back to the photo. Seeing the cross she'd been wearing the day the photo was taken, now crumpled on her lifeless neck, felt to Heidi almost unbearably moving. Two days earlier, Heidi knew, this woman had been packing her suitcase in Athens and looking forward to a weekend trip to Cairo. Now she was dead. The necklace provided confirmation to ID the body. That was why Heidi had come to the morgue, to make the formal identification. There was nobody else to do it. The woman had no friends or family in Malta. She had been traveling alone. Heidi had just come from the hospital's ICU, which was full of burned and injured people. She was running on adrenaline and caffeine, shaken by the events of the last 48 hours and by an odd feeling of kinship with a stranger. She had not expected to feel this way about the dead woman. Maybe it was exhaustion but she didn't think so. Her task complete, Heidi found she couldn't leave, not yet. She continued to stand rooted to the spot in the basement of St. Luke's, the island's only hospital, a blocky post-war building that looked particularly out of place here in one of the most splendid ancient neighborhoods in the Mediterranean region. The hospital stood in the old city, a fortified area preserved from the Middle Ages, replete with 16th century bastions and towers and defensive walls, beautiful stone edifices dating back to the era of the Knights Hospitaller. The past two days had been endless and strange. First, there had been the phone call interrupting Heidi's dinner in a seaside restaurant with Maltese friends. Then the sprint to her car and the race to Luca Airport, 
Then nearly two days in a makeshift command center where Heidi and two Arab men sat ridiculously close together at a small table, the three of them trading a rotary phone back and forth, taking turns talking to their governments about the hijacked plane on the tarmac. One of her seatmates was a Libyan diplomat, the other a representative of the Palestine Liberation Organization. The two men had not known Heidi was an American spy. They thought she was a capable but somewhat abrasive. She got testy in crises. She knew that. American who worked at the U.S. Embassy processing visas. In fact, Heidi was a CIA station chief. As far as she knew, the only female station chief in the world. When it was her turn with the phone, Heidi spoke in pig Latin to her secretary, Jackie. Spycraft called upon unexpected talents. You never knew what qualities, what tricks learned in girlhood you would need. And that, of course, is our guest today, Smithsonian Associate Liza Monday, reading from her new book, The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA. Further, Liza Monday will tell us today, and she compellingly argues, that as the CIA grappled with its identity post Cold War, it was a tightly knit network of female analysts who first perceived the rising threat of Al Qaeda. Though tragically, their cautions were repeatedly dismissed. Unlikely spies, yes, but perfect for their role. Seen as inconsequential, these pioneering women navigated the espionage hotbeds of Bonn, Geneva, and Moscow, even the capture of Osama bin Laden at his compound in Pakistan, and adeptly swiping secrets right from under the noses of their KGB counterparts. Back at the CIA headquarters, they were the architects of the agency's critical archives, transitioning from manual to digital, always perceptive to details unnoticed by their male superiors. Please join me in welcoming Smithsonian Associate Liza Monday, who will take us through these untold stories revealing how these women not only helped shape the modern intelligence era, but also how their marginalization made our world more vulnerable. Stay tuned for a journey into the secret corridors of history where the unsung heroines of the CIA finally get their due. Liza Mundy, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so nice to talk to you, too, about your new book. I've got a copy of it right here in my hands. You've just read a section of it titled The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA. You've written Code Girls, a bestseller. This is just a wonderful book. I want to get into it. But let's start by maybe just telling our audience a little bit about what you're going to tell them at Smithsonian Associates. Your upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation is coming up soon. You'll be using Zoom. We're all on Zoom these days, it seems. So how will you engage our audience and maybe briefly tell us a little bit about your presentation? Yes, well, I'll be treating the audience to um, some wonderful images, for one thing. Uh, The women that I interviewed for my book who served as spies for the CIA during the Cold War and into the counterterrorism period, they shared with me historic photos of their spy training, of their times overseas when they were working undercover, collecting intelligence uh, for the for the United States government, uh, performing covert actions. And uh, many of these photos, well, all of the photos have never been seen before. And, uh, and I'm also going to be talking about the stereotypes, the sort of dismissive thinking, um, complete with quotes from from studies and other reports, really, in my view, outrageous quotes about uh, various reasons why women couldn't be good spies, which was really the thinking at the CIA for decades and decades. And it's important. I mean, it, it in, in many ways, it was a, a madman type environment that we may feel that we're familiar with, uh, the sort of dismissive thinking that uh, that women in many workplaces encountered uh, for many decades during the 20th century and even into this century. Uh, and we may think that we're familiar with that kind of a story. But when we're talking about the world's foremost intelligence gathering organization 
and the importance that the Central Intelligence Agency plays in Washington and around the world in terms of collecting information, protecting our national security, and alerting the president and the national security community to threats, uh, you know, it really matters if 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 half of the talented workforce is being channeled and dismissed and subjected to various stereotypical thinking. So as part of my presentation, I feature a couple of the quotes um, that were that were tossed around quite freely in the halls of Langley uh, when studies were periodically done in the 1950s, the 1970s, the 1990s, what we today would call institutional sexism uh, about, you know, well, women can't spy because they won't be taken seriously in foreign countries. Women can't spy because they're just going to quit when they get married. Uh, women don't have the sort of moxie and deal making abilities to persuade someone to pass secrets uh, to betray their own government and pass secrets. Um, just this this really sort of cascade of of pronouncements that were uttered by CIA directors, by station chiefs over the uh, over the centuries. And what I try to do in my presentation and also in the book is provide really vivid, compelling evidence of of women's resourcefulness and fortitude and courage and um, you know the same the same sort of uh, resourcefulness and and sometimes manipulative abilities, um, moxie that that the men were displaying uh, was certainly always displayed by women who were determined to battle their way into the spy course. So I hope that readers will also feel a sense of story in terms of how this institution was built, how women changed and contributed to the institution and its development, and how the the institution came to change its mind about women and to understand women's importance and to become more what we would call today inclusive and why this matters, why this matters so much to have your full array of gifts and talents serving American national security. And that that culminates in the book in the hunt for Osama bin Laden, which was um, strike which women contributed to in striking numbers and which would absolutely not have succeeded uh, without the president presence and persistence and self-confidence of a group of female targeters who were uh, who who were tracking bin Laden for for years and and finally succeeded. Yeah, it's an amazing book, and I have to tell you, I I agree. I I learned so much, and and I I I was surprised. I was a bit outraged that I I had no idea that this had existed. Even you know, as you as you say, for decades, for even for centuries, the 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 reference that you make to the photos. Um, is is welcome and and uh, I just want to call attention to to the book. I as I say, I've got a copy of it, and you generously sent and generously read, and it's it's just wonderful. Please, audience, pick this book up and check out the photos because they're amazing. And one in particular jumped out at me because it it's it, it's dated, and and of course it's not a woman who was in the CIA, but a woman who talked her way into the Pinkerton Detective Agency, and I'm referring to Kate Warren, I think is how her name is perhaps yes. pronounced. And yeah. that's yes. a fascinating story because of what she knew and how much she could help, and yet she wasn't regarded. So, you know, she was a very humble person, and and um, and and you, you might tell her a little bit of her story. And yes, well, Kate Warren shows that women have been contributing to uh, intelligence gathering, national security, and in her case, detective work mm -hmm. since uh, well, since the country's founding. And because often when people think of espionage or spycraft, they think of Mata Hari. You know, yeah. they think of a sex pot out there attracting men and and getting them to, to you know tell her secrets through pillow talk and mm -hmm. nothing could be further from the truth and and Kate Warren really embodies that she actually headed the ladies section of the Pinkerton Detective Agency uh, and it, and she presented herself to Alan Pinkerton in the 19th century and she said look I can move around unobserved I mean this is this is women's great gift. Uh, for much of history is because when you're underestimated, when you're inconspicuous, when people think you're a laundress or a secretary 
or a clerk, like who could be better positioned to move around the world incognito? It, basically, her argument to Helen Pinkerton was, look, women are undercover anyway. People are going to think I'm a laundress. I can go around. I can enter people's homes. I can enter people's employment. I can go to bars. I can find out the information that you need. And Kate Warren actually um, smuggled Abraham Lincoln to Washington before his first inauguration when they got wind of, wind of a potential assassination attempt. They cloaked him as uh, and presented him as an invalid and, and smuggled him aboard a train. And Kate Warren posed as his humble caregiving sister. Hmm. So that's a great example of how nobody would suspect a woman of performing this sort of undercover work. And uh, and the same was true during that period of time of Harriet Tubman, who, of course, is very famous and well known now. Uh, but at the time when she was running this extraordinary in exfiltration network, I mean, Harriet Tubman was a spy master and she was doing what um, what women in France would do during the Second World War when they were smuggling downed airmen out of occupied France. She was obviously smuggling enslaved Americans out of the South uh, into the free North. And nobody would suspect, you know, a black woman uh, in in 19th century, mid 19th century America to be capable and in charge and a logistical genius. So, you know, far from uh, using their sexual wiles to tease information out of unsuspecting men, women have been moving around the world unnoticed, creating safe spaces. Um, during the Civil War, there was a group of women who, uh, simply by having, um, you know, parties and soirees and creating these social spaces, the women who spied both for the North and the South during the Civil War. So that's a historical example of how women have always contributed. Hi, it's Paul. Do you love entertaining, informative, eclectic, insightful programs about culture, health, science, life, and everything Smithsonian? As part of our Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast, we're introducing you to the new Smithsonian Associates streaming series. Smithsonian, a nonprofit organization, is excited to present this new aspect of their 55 years as the world's largest museum-based educational program. Join us from the comfort of your home as we periodically interview Smithsonian Associate guest speakers. Our audience here on radio and podcast can explore our website for more information, links, and details at notold-better.com. Thanks, everybody. Our guest today is best-selling author Liza Monday. Liza Monday is a Smithsonian associate who's written the new book, The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA. Liza Monday will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates coming up. Please check our show notes today for more details about Liza Monday's presentation and more information about Smithsonian Associates. Liza Monday, the book is fantastic. Thanks for sharing the story of, of Heidi and, and Shirley Sulik, as well as Kate Warren. I wonder if you if we could go back for just a second and um, talk about the Osama bin Laden um, role that women played in, in tracking him down, and because that's a fantastic story too. There, there's amazing contributions in, in in just such a monumental effort, and maybe you could uh, tell us briefly about that because I think that's a that's a great uh, you know piece of history that that is told so well by by your book. Thank you. And that is really, uh, thank you so much for saying that. And and that is was really actually the starting point for this book. I, I had heard that there was a group of women analysts uh, back at headquarters in Langley who really started tracking Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda in the early to mid 90s, before anybody knew the name Al Qaeda, before the CIA knew the name Al Qaeda, uh, there was a group of women who were paying attention to these stateless fighters who had been fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. And then once the war in Afghanistan was ended and the Soviet occupiers were driven out, these fighters weren't going back to their home countries. They were communicating with each other and coalescing. They wanted to keep jihad going. They wanted to fight the infidel, and they wanted to take on the United States. They wanted to drive the United States out of the Middle East and, and cause America a lot of pain. 
And so really before uh, before the CIA had made the transition from the Cold War to the counterterrorism era, this group of women analysts were were listening to intercepted conversations, were piecing together who was communicating with whom, uh, were paying attention to this uh, this mysterious financier Osama bin Laden, whose name at that point had hardly ever appeared even in the Western press. And they were trying to get attention in the building. Uh, you know, the CIA is is a large organization with, with spies, undercover officers that work overseas collecting information. But then there's also this huge core of analysts back at headquarters. And it's their job to make sense of the information to write up classified bulletins that are distributed within the building, but also to the president and the national security community. And these women found that being inconspicuous and underestimated is not such an advantage in a bureaucracy, in a hierarchical elitist bureaucracy where you really need to have clout, you need to be able to make your voice known, you need to be able to persuade editors uh, that your classified bulletin about the importance of Al Qaeda really should be placed in the president's daily brief. They had to fight really tough institutional bureaucratic turf to get spots in, in the important real estate that is the president's daily brief. So there was a group of women before 9-11 who were trying very hard to raise the alarm. And, um, and you know, and finally by the two year 2000, you know, they were starting to break through, certainly to CIA director George Tenet, um, but but trying to raise the alarm in the greater national security community, which was really struggling with, OK, if we know this sort of ragtag group is a threat, like what do we do about it? You know, do we assassinate Osama bin Laden? Do we bomb him where we think he is? What sort of collateral civilian damage uh, will will we contend with? And and that was a very difficult period for the agency or for the national security community to figure out what to do. And but but the women in predicting 9/11, tracking and targeting these terrorists, um, were were in some ways. Um, you know, there there's been some attention to the um, to the situation with Hamas in in the Middle East in in Israel, and there was a group of women spotters uh, watching the border, trying to call attention to Hamas's activities and and warn. And there was also a woman analyst. There's been a lot of coverage about this who was really warning and not being listened to. So history was repeating itself, and and that was true here before 9/11. Um, so then after 9/11, when the CIA is contending with a sense of failure, uh, with grief, uh, with, with just, um, you know, trying so hard not to prevent a, a second wave, trying so hard to prevent a second wave of attacks, these female analysts and, and, and their male colleagues were just, you know, beset by, uh, by all sorts of responsibilities and, and burdens. But along the way, uh, this this field of targeting, of manhunting, of tracking individuals around the world was really pushed forward and refined over a period of 10 years. Uh, you know, at, with the war in Afghanistan, there were a lot of members of Al Qaeda who had been collected in Afghanistan. So we go to war in Afghanistan. They disperse all over the world. Osama bin Laden is in hiding. All these terrorists who, who might have been sort of located, there were locations understood before 9-11, uh, had to be found again. And it was targeting was a field, a new field at the CIA. It was not prestigious at first. Uh, it wasn't out there spying, collecting information, which is really the most prestigious job to have. It's like being a fighter pilot. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, the, the James Bond role. Uh, and that was the role that for many decades, the, the guys in charge wanted to sort of keep to themselves. So this role of targeting, of working at headquarters, of really doing painstaking archival work and, and working with technology that was, um, you know, the ability to intercept conversations, the ability to listen in, the ability to um, aerial surveillance uh, through drones. It was really women that developed this painstaking and persistent ability to, to find people. And so the, the team of targeters who were tracking bin Laden, they had to understand relationships, even though, even though they had, um, in better and better and better uh, technological uh, resources from the NSA, from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, uh, they they had to try to find a man, Osama bin Laden, who didn't use technology, who who understood that he couldn't have his IP address 
uh, be exposed or use a cell phone that, you know, that, that any sort of technology could be pinpointed, uh, by American technology. And so he was holed up somewhere they knew not using technology, but he had to communicate with human beings who were using technology. And, and so they, uh, they came up with, um, strategies, you know, for, okay, well, who, who around him, his family members, his, the couriers, uh, the media, other, other terrorist leaders, these human beings that the, he had to communicate with, they understood these human relationships and, and the need, this basic human need for communication under any circumstances. So they figured out who he would likely be in contact with. They tracked those people often by finding people who knew them. Uh, they had to understand, you know, know, who was, who was a, the brother or the cousin of an important person. So they, they found the courier who was carrying bin Laden's messages and they found his Jeep and they enabled us forces to track the Jeep back to the compound in a um, uh, where bin Laden was living. And they had perfected uh, they had honed their abilities. You know, they studied the laundry on the line mm. in the compound where he was living to try to understand how many families were there. His bodyguard, who was also the courier, was living there with his family. Uh, the courier, I think it was his brother, was also living there with his family. They knew there were three families living in this compound. Uh, they knew that there was a very tall man called the Pacer who would walk back and forth, but they couldn't tell who it was. They thought it was probably bin Laden. They were increasingly sure. Uh, and they had to... They had to assure President Obama, CIA Director Leon Panetta, um, all the high-level members of the national security community that this really was bin Laden. And not only that, they knew who the children were, the ages of the children, what floors of the compound they were living on. They knew where his wives were so that civilian casualties could be avoided to the extent possible so that the lives of women and children could be saved to the extent possible, even as they knew that some of the women might be wearing a suicide vest. They knew that terrorists did not hesitate to use their own families as human shields. Uh, but so, so the Navy SEALs who assaulted the compound were astonished by how accurate the, uh, the, the blueprint was for who was going to be where in that compound. And they were able to find bin Laden and to take him out uh, and to minimize the other casualties, even as though there were other casualties, the bodyguards and and some uh, family members. But but they minimized the casualties to the fullest extent possible. And, and without the role of those, without those targeters, without this, this field of targeting that women had really developed at the CIA, because it was a field they had been sort of pushed into at a time when it wasn't important without it, what we, again, what we would call inclusion mm -hmm. without we, the, 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 the hunt would never have succeeded. Uh, and it's just a fact. And, and every, everyone I interviewed agreed about that. Uh, so it was an extraordinary operation, extraordinary bravery on the part of the SEALs who assaulted the compound, but they couldn't have done it without the targeters. Liza Mundy is our guest today, Smithsonian Associate, and will be presenting at Smithsonian Associates coming up as the author of the new book, The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA. The book is just getting rave reviews. I loved it, but I'm not the only one, Liza Mundy. Kate Moore, a best-selling author of The Radium Girls, says this masterful book cements Liza Mundy as one of our foremost historians. It is an absolute epic. Ignore this book and these astonishing women at your peril. I wonder if you'll take us out, just kind of final question for you today, because I know you're very busy and we sure appreciate your time. But in light of all of this research that you've done, all the history that you've uncovered, what do you see the women's role evolving in intelligence? How, what what is that going to look like in the in the near future? Well, uh, I hopefully will. And we've had a CIA director now, mm -hmm. a female CIA director, Gina Haspel. We have a female director of national intelligence, um, Avril Haines. Uh, so, uh, women, I I think will you know continue to be certainly in this country uh, and hopefully around the world, uh, full-fledged members of the intelligence community. I mean, it's still the challenge of living overseas, living an undercover life, working a day job, 
uh, and then working this your real night job at most you know, actual spies who travel overseas are working often under diplomatic cover during the day and then doing their real spy job at night and on weekends and in you know undisclosed locations it's still tough on you know say a working parent and and I one of the people I interviewed Congresswoman um, Abigail Spanberger who's mm -hmm. a member of Congress from Virginia yep. she was a CIA uh, operative for for ten years and she has three young children and and a husband who traveled with her overseas but it's it's never easy and uh, and I think she finds being a member of Congress uh, <laughs> actually a little bit more conducive to working parenthood which is is kind of surprising. Yep. Uh, and so, you know, so there are challenges that are always going to exist and the institution, and this is true, of course, in the diplomatic corps as well, uh, uh, civil servants who, who travel overseas to work on behalf of the American government are working in very lonely places, very isolated places, and sometimes very dangerous places. And it's never going to be easy. I One of my favorite, also other characters in the book, Molly Chambers, a young woman who served overseas um, after, a uh, decade after 9-11, working in African countries. She helped bring she helped bring the Nigerian Chibok girls home, uh, the kidnapped uh, Nigerian schoolgirls. So it's a different mm. a different sort of targeting wow. and hunting of of, of the, the, these most vulnerable vulnerable victims of terrorism. Uh, she helped find them and bring them home. And and she talked about you know the the loneliness and hardship of these locations. So we shouldn't forget that we shouldn't forget how hard this work is and the sacrifices. Um, and hardships that that people are putting up with. I mean, she described she was in she was in the hospital with um, she had E. coli and she was getting an IV transfusion and and there was an urgent operation that she had to uh, take part in and she pulled the IV line out and just left the hospital. So, uh, you know, this is a young woman in Africa uh, under those kinds of conditions. So, Amazing. I I the the. Really, the contributions of these undercover operatives, it's, it seems very glamorous, and we still think of James Bond, uh, and it is, but it is also hard and lonely, and, um, and, 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 and the sacrifices are, are still being made. It's, it's never going to be easy, and, uh, and I hope we just remember and, and are grateful for the Americans overseas who, who are doing this work because they, they know how important it is to protect democracy and to protect American lives. Thank you. And, and congratulations, Liza Monday, on this wonderful book. Again, the title of the book is The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA. Smithsonian Associate Liza Monday has been our guest today. We will have links so that our audience can find out more information about Liza Monday's books, plural, as well as her new book, The Sisterhood, and her upcoming presentation at Smithsonian Associates. So great to talk to you. Um, Please come back and talk again because this is just fascinating stuff. I, I personally enjoy this. I know our audience will. So thank you for having me, and, and I really look forward to the talk and the interactions. My thanks to Smithsonian Associate Liza Monday, whose new book, The Sisterhood, The Secret History of Women at the CIA, is available now. Please check it out. You can check out Liza Monday at Smithsonian Associates coming up. So please refer to our show notes today for details on Liza Monday's presentation at Smithsonian Associates titled The Secret History of Women at the CIA. My thanks always to the Smithsonian team for all they do to support the show. And my thanks to you, my wonderful Not Old Better show audience here on radio and podcast. Please be well, be safe. Let's talk about better. The Not Old Better show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. We will see you next week. Thanks for joining us this week on the Not Old Better show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast.